for melodic heavy metal. Playing it heavier. Louder. Raunchier. Faster. This is the signals of intuition. Is this the way it's supposed to feel? Baby, I'm gonna let you go. That was loud and clear right there off of their 2002 record, Disconnected. That was Time to Let Go. You're listening to The Signals of Intuition, your home for everything melodic hard rock and heavy metal. Tonight on the show, we've got a very special guest. We've got Jess Harnell, the singer of Loud and Clear. He's also the singer of the 80s metal and 80s pop mashup band Rock Sugar. But perhaps you know him a little bit better as the voice actor behind a number of voices on TV, video games, and films for the last 25 years or so. He's been wacko in Animaniacs, Captain Hero on Drawn Together, Ironhide in the Transformers films, the voice of America's Funniest Home Videos for the last 15 plus years, and just a slew of other things. Make sure to go online and check all of that out. So right here, let's get Jess on the line. Hello. Hey Jess, Brandon from CGMFM, how you doing? Dude, what's up? Good to talk to you finally, dude. I'm sorry that it took a long time to get together. Oh, no worries. I know how busy you are, so it's all good. Thanks, bro. Well, thanks for, uh, for taking the time and for calling. Can you hear me good? Is the connection good? Oh, yeah. It sounds great on your end. It's perfect. Perfect. Okay, Um. so I guess let's start from the beginning, from your early life. Uh, where did you grow up? Dude, I grew up on the East Coast. I was born in New Jersey, and I don't have any accent left, which is awesome, because I don't want people to think I'm on The Sopranos. And then <laughs> I moved to Philadelphia, my dad was the musical director for a show called The Mike Douglas Show, which was sort of like a daytime Johnny Carson show. And he got to uh, play piano. For, he played piano for everybody anyway, but he played piano for everybody from like uh, Tarvis Streisand and Frank Sinatra to, you know, all the people from The Wizard of Oz. He even was the musical director for the week that John Lennon was on the show. So we got to work with John for a week, which I was too young to realize how cool that was. But now I know how cool that was. <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> Especially, I mean, you recorded... Um... Uh, Beatles cover for The Sound of Your Voice, right? Yeah, dude, look at that. Well, you know, they're my favorite band of all time. The Sound of Your Voice, that's something I haven't thought about in a long time. Yeah, they're, they're you know, if, if, if you don't love the Beatles, then something's probably seriously wrong with you because <laughs> they're sort of like the tree that everything else grew out of, including me, you know, so I'm just a huge, huge Beatle dude and, uh, you know, they kind of run a thread in my whole life because even like my first big animated show was Animaniacs where I was basically doing a uh, tribute to the Beatles you know, when I played Wacko on that. Oh, really? Which uh, which one were you imitating? Well, you know, man, it's funny because they all sound different. You know, I mean, John's voice was like, you know, that he shop so and it sounded like there was a point on it. And, you know, Paul's voice was always in the good old, like, smoky. I'm like, I really you pitch. I mean, George, he sounded like he had a cold and was congested and gringo was out there at the bottom, you know. So when I first started doing that maniac, I started doing it like, I guess it was really more like John, wasn't it? Yeah, it was like this. And then when they showed me a picture of the character, though, I knew he was very small. So I had to make his voice very little. And then I said, you know, it's like a beetle on helium. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a helium. <laughs> um, so obviously, I'm sure your dad had an influence on you becoming a musician. But what led you to become a singer? Oh, man, you know, my dad was so musical. And my mom was a big band singer, Brandon. She was, uh, she still is a great singer. But she sang with all those big bands, like in the 40s and 50s and stuff. And in fact, she had the opera to go on the road with Benny Goodman as his girl singer, but she wanted to have a family, God bless her. Um, you know, that was before <laughs> my time. But, uh, but you know, she, she was that kind of gal. So she was always singing, and what really made me want to become a singer, I, I thought I wanted to be an actor. Um, and then when I was a little kid, I realized that, first of all, being in bands meant that suddenly girls paid more attention to you than if you were yep. in school place, and I thought that was good. And then I heard Steve Perry sing, and that was what really got the ball rolling, because I went, wow, I want to do what that guy does. And, I would lock myself in my room and sing along to every Journey record imaginable until I was like toreting out, you know, Steve Perry runs <laughs> my <laughs> sleep. <laughs> so who are some, besides Journey, who are some of your other key musical influences growing up? Well, I like, as I said, you know, the Beatles is the first. Um, in terms of, but I listen to everything. I always say there's only two kinds of music. It's, there's good and bad, and it's up to you to figure out which is which, and you're never wrong. Because whatever, you know, you think is good music is good music if it's good for you, you know? Um, so I never, like, restrained or, you know, uh, made myself restricted in terms of what I listened to. And on any given day, you know, my playlist, I have Judas Priest and Simon and Garfunkel and uh, a band called Anne Berlin 
and some Christian rock. And it's like, I, just, I listen to everything that's good where, where people are singing good and having good songs. But in terms of early influences, uh, songwriting, certainly the Beatles, Journey, uh, you know, in, in terms of singers, Robert Plant was, was a really big one for me, too. Uh, David Coverdale was somebody I looked up to. Don Henley from the Eagles. You know, again, I, I just, I, I love anytime anybody can sing a song without Pro Tools and write a song without having somebody from Sweden do it for them. <laughs> I, think that's, I, I think that's pretty good. Now, do you play any other instruments besides uh, singing? Dude, my only unfulfilled uh, goal in my life at this point, I mean, you know, you always get out goals. I'm sure there's more than this, but I've been very, very blessed, and I, I've, I've achieved a lot of the things that I wanted to achieve. But one of the few things that I haven't done that I really like to do is learn to play guitar. Just because I think it'd be so awesome to take a guitar to the park and sit there and play songs and, you know, be able to keep myself entertained. But at a very early age, I, I became a really great pal with Chuck Duran, who was the guitar player for Rock Sugar and my best buddy in the world. And he played so good that I sort of figured, ah, let, <laughs> let him do it, man. You know, uh, but I'd still like to learn. So, no, in answer to your question, I have a very strong sense of melody and stuff like that, but I'm just I'm just a guy who plays a nice band. Mm, okay. Um, now, switching, I guess we'll uh, keep talking about music here. Um, the first thing I ever heard you on, and the earliest thing I can find you recorded on, is uh, 1995 Sound of Your Voice. Um, did you play any other bands before that record? Oh, yeah, dude. There's a band, you know, the origins of Rock Sugar are in a band called Loud and Clear. First of all, I've been in bands my whole life, Brandon. I, I you know... When I was uh, 15, me and Chucky both joined a band, and uh, my claim to fame with that band was our first gig we ever did was at a Catholic girls' school, and they made us stop playing because I wasn't wearing underwear. <laughs> <laughs> that was the beginning of my musical career. And uh, let's see, after that, we, we, that, that band was called Sardonics, and I had a band called Dream Street with a couple guys from Polly Hatchie, and don't ask me why. Then after that, me and Chucky put together Loud and Clear, and Loud and Clear actually got kind of a big cult audience, particularly overseas in like Europe and Japan and stuff like that. And everybody really dug it a lot. If you like Def Leppard, if you like Journey and Song Lion and Rock like that, Loud and Clear is great, and you can find it online and, and stuff like that. It's really cool. Um, I'm always fond of saying that, you know, the things that I do, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm very objective about them, and I, I've been involved in a lot of things that weren't great, but if I am involved in something that's really great, I, I always said I'd like it even if I had nothing to do with it. Loud and Clear was such good melodic rock, you know, um, but at the same time, I learned a lesson, which was, and, and through finding other great melodic rock bands who've been more or less undiscovered by the world at large, you find out that it really isn't about how talented you are or how good the songs are that you write and sing. It's really more about getting the right people behind you at the exact right moment and then all the chips falling into place magically. By now, it, it seems like it's been crazier than ever to try to succeed in music, but that's why Rock Sugar, the success of Rock Sugar was so funny because that, you know, you spend your whole life beating your head on a wall trying to figure out how to do a band and actually, you know, get paid for it and get to play good shows and all the rest of it. And then one day you say to your buddy, hey, wouldn't it be crazy if some 80s hair metal band got brainwashed into thinking that pop was metal? And then the next thing you know, you're opening for Aerosmith. And it's like, that's, that's the craziest thing. But, but it worked, and, and God bless America, here we are. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Um, now, jumping back to uh, Loud and Clear for a second, I'll tell you right up front, my favorite record from you guys was uh, Disconnected. I just love oh, that thanks, disc. Man. Thank you, bro. Did you hear the uh, Did you hear the demo CD, the one that it, it doesn't sound that great, but it's like uh, it's got a bunch of good songs on it. Have you heard that one? Yeah, the, the first one, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. From the like 97 or so? Yeah, I, I yeah, have heard it. I don't, I don't own that one, so I've only kind of sampled bits and pieces of it. Um, in terms of Disconnected, like that one was obviously a huge step up in terms of production, and I kind of yeah. felt songwriting from what I've heard. Uh, what do you sort of remember about that whole record and sort of the vibe behind it? Uh, well, you know, I was working with Chucky and Alex Trash, who went on to be the drummer for Rock Sugar, and Chuck and Alex are both excellent uh, producer engineers, and that's, you know, one of the reasons that record sounded so great, and the Rock Sugar record, too, because those guys are so good at what they do. Um, but what I remember about it primarily is that they kept telling me not to sing high. They're like, dude, don't sing high because it's very 80s. It's very 80s. So everything was like, oh, take it down, take it down, take it down. <laughs> um, which was kind of weird because, you know, you grow up singing that a certain way and you think that's cool and everything like that. And they were like, well, that was then and this is now sort of thing. I still really like that record. I think I'm proud of the songs on it and everything. And the vocals. It's just more, you know, like... Uh, Joe Elliott, say, to Steve Perry, uh, yeah. uh, vocally. But, you know, it was really great. And, and furthermore, that's when we figured out we really liked playing together. Of course, the funny thing is, in Rock Sugar, I'm singing as high as I ever sang on anything. Again, so it's, <laughs> it's, 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 everything, you know, everything comes around, bro. 
<laughs> now, do you mind if we talk about uh, voice acting for a little bit before we dive back into music? Yeah, of course, dude. So what shows or characters do you get recognized for the most? Well, that's, that's the amazing thing, man. You know, I have been so inordinately blessed. It's like I was talking to my buddy Rob Paulson, who's another really, really great voice actor. And, you know, oh, uh, Wacko, or not Wacko. Um, he was Yakko, Yakko right? Yeah, Yakko, yeah. Yakko. Yakko. Dude, he was Yakko, he was Pinky, and get this, he was one of the original new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles on the first animated series of that back in like the 80s. Mm -hmm. Now they brought it back on Nickelodeon for a new animated series, and he's a different turtle on that one. And it's like, we were just talking about how amazing it is that in show business, if you are affiliated with one show, if you have one hit show, one hit movie, you have beaten the odds by such an enormous amount. And, you know, it, it, as great as that is, it only lasts for a couple of years, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, with voiceover, the crazy thing is that it's supposed to be in, like, one of the Brady Bunch or somebody that was on MASH or somebody that was on, you know, even Friends or something. It's like, rather than having one big claim to fame, we've all, you know, been fortunate and blessed enough to be involved in, like, 20, 30 big things in popular culture over the span of 25, 30 years, you know? So what I get recognized for is everything from my first thing was doing Roger Rabbit, so I get recognized for that, and then I got I get recognized for Animaniacs, and then I get recognized for Transformers, and I get recognized for Drawn Together, and The Cleveland Show, and Finding Nemo, and Up, and Toy Story, and all these other things that I've, that I've done that have cumulatively created this big body of work that you look back and you go, man, I've been busy, i got to go take a nap. <laughs> Um, are there any other shows that you've been involved with that you wish had gotten bigger or more accolades? Oh, um, well, let's, let's see. That's a good question. I was actually thinking about that. I did one for Disney XD last year called Motor City that I thought was really, really great. It only went one season, which I was surprised by. Also, um, hang on, Drawn Together was this huge show on Comedy Central was doing great, but then there was some sort of conflict between the creators and the network, I think. So it kind of ended abruptly. It ended while it was still on top, which is weird. Um, and then there was a show that Amit Zappa, of all people, developed about a heavy metal band that uh, was really, really funny. I mean, I guess it was, you know, it, had nothing, it was nothing like Rock Sugar, but it was a funny-looking heavy metal. And I was involved in that, and not only as one of the guys in the band, I think my name was Wyatt Riot, which was pretty good. <laughs> but I, I was also the voice of Ronnie James Dio, who appeared in these guys as like a vision. So I thought that was pretty cool. And what what so show funny. is this? I'm to look this up now. Oh, it never aired, man. You might just Google, like, Amit Zappa, heavy metal cartoon. <laughs> oh, you'll wow. probably find something. Yeah, and there was another one too, man. What was there was something I did. Oh, damn! Now I remember it. It was for Disney, uh, like a couple years ago, where these two kids wanted to be like shredding guitar players, and they appealed to like the legends of rock who all lived in this cave, and I was doing those dudes. But I don't remember the name of that one either because it didn't go. I only remember names if I see them on a lot of checks. <laughs> <laughs> um, what characters rank among your favorites to date that you've done? Oh, that I've done? Oh, man, dude. Well, you know, Wacko is very dear to my heart because it was the first big original character that I did as opposed to doing voice matches. Um, and so I, he's really special because he broke through. And again, he, he kind of harkened back to my childhood because I got to be a Beatle, sort of. Yeah. Um, that's very, very special. Um, I love all the Disney stuff. Man. There's something very special about being the voice of Prince Charming. You know, like I'm the voice of Prince Charming for Disney. And uh, so I tell my girl all the time, I go, look, man, you know, I'm, I'm actually Prince Charming. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, because every girl wants to be Prince Charming. Um, and uh, yeah, what else? Other ones, man. Oh, I love you. Know what I love, dude. I love being the voice of America's Funniest Home Videos because I've been the voice of that show for 18 years, and I just think it's awesome that there's a TV show that kids can watch with their parents, who can watch with their parents, and everybody laughs at. It. Oh yeah. And I think that's pretty, yeah. And Tom Bergeron, the host of the show, said he wants to go, Jess, as long as people keep hitting each other in the nuts, we're going to have a show. And I'm like, <laughs> you're right. Man. Uh, and there's also a show called Adventures in Odyssey that I worked on, which is like a, a huge Christian radio show. It's not as well-known. I mean, it's very, very well-known for what it is. It's not as well-known as some of the more mainstream things like the Pixar movies or stuff. Mm -hmm. But I, I love that, too, because it's such a great message. And it, it talks about you know family and the importance of living well. It's not overtly preachy. But it does talk about God, and it's very positive, you know. So I, I like anything that's positive, man, as opposed to negative. There's so much negative in the world, and it's like, I don't want to keep up with the Kardashians. I want to get way, way in front of them. <laughs> I hear that. <laughs> um, now, when, <laughs> when you go to do a voiceover session, do you have any special warm-ups? Like, how do you take care of your voice with such a schedule like yours? That's a good question. I'll tell you when I got in a, tr a little bit of trouble, man, because my voice is very, very strong. I think it's just because I've been pushing the hell out of it for so long, but... It, it did get intense when we were really, really digging a lot with Rock Sugar because I would work all week. I sometimes do, like, you know, 
three, four episodes of cartoon in a day. And then, you know, I, I do that every day. And then there's a lot of that screaming and going crazy. And then I go on the weekends and do rock sugar shows. And that stuff is like serious singing. It's not like, you know, I'm, I'm not pulling a 50 cent up there, man. It's like, you know, it's singing and it's, it's screaming and it's doing that, you know, that kind of demanding vocal stuff. Oh, yeah. So my voice would get really, really tired. Um, basically, thank God it doesn't go that often. I don't lose it very much. But when I get tired, I shut up. I just don't talk. I literally, there's sometimes where I carry around a pad of paper and I just write stuff to people because they got to protect it. Exactly. In terms of warming up, I found the most expeditious way for me to warm up, man, is I just roll my, it's really weird. I kind of go from the bottom of the top. I'll I'll give you a two second extra. I just kind of go, and I just kind of wake it all up. I wake up from like a low note to a high note. I start much lower than that. I go higher than that. By the time I do that for like a minute, I'm usually ready to go. Oh, wow. Oh, so, well, that's that's a lot quicker than, you know, just slowly building up the scales or whatever, you know? Oh, yeah. And that's what a lot of people do. And God bless them, dude. I just, I, I always find that I'm in a hurry. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so when when you get sick or something like that happens where your voice just isn't feeling it one day if you had to use like steroids or anything like uh, the guys on the south park show they always talk about having to use that eh, if they get sick oh yeah man you know well, it's funny because uh sometimes you do like because what happens is your vocal cords get swollen and when they get swollen they don't connect as well as if they're not swollen so it's harder to produce the various sounds that you need to produce so yes there have definitely been times when i've had these steroids in very very limited basis i mean i'm not talking about like arnold schwarzenegger steroids. <laughs> it's not like it's not like i sit there and i'm going i need more steroids i have to look out and do my arms it's not, it's not like that it's like uh you take them for two or three days and then hopefully you know between that and being quiet when you can you know you get better so i think we've all done that anybody who's a lead singer in a band or who does, does crazy stuff with their voices has probably had a resort to steroids at one time or another but not on any kind of Olympic level, you know, I mean, or bodybuilder yeah. level. It's nothing like that. Um, so now jumping back to Rock Sugar, so you kind of uh, sort of briefly address this, but how did Rock Sugar come about? Like compared to say Loud and Clear, where everything's original, how do you go from this idea where you take original songs and you say, okay, we're going to do 80s metal, sort of a pop, sort of mashup kind of thing? Well, you know, we were really good buzz with like the guys in Steel Panther and everything like that. And we used to go see them and they'd get me up to sing with them and stuff. And, and I thought they were great and they still are great. Now, of course, they kind of carved out their own niche they're kind of doing comedy metal where you know they're writing these really obscene songs but they're funny and they sound like 80s metal but when we used to go see them they were basically just doing 80s covers you know and they would do them really really well i mean they would do them probably better than the people who originally did them but <laughs> we would and, and they pulled big crap out and everything like that and, and uh, you know it, it was a fun thing and people would say you guys should do something like that man you guys should do something like that you could because you know with you doing the imitations you can sing like different people and that'd be really entertaining. And I'm like, yeah, but you know what? I don't want to do that. I don't really want to be a tribute band thing because I don't know. I think I get bored and, um, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to find some kind of weird twist we could put on it. Plus, Steel Panther is doing that. You do it so good, you know, and we live up the street from them. Yeah. So there's not really, you know, much point. Well, eventually we went on this thing. We got invited, me and Chuck and Al got invited to, uh, to go over to Turks and Caicos. We get all kinds of weird invitations. Uh, this island in the, up there in the Caribbean, and, and uh, they said, hey, can you guys come out here and play, like, five acoustic songs a day, and in exchange, we'll fly out, we'll give you a, you know, a great room, and we'll take you kayaking and teach you to parasail and all these things. And so we're like, oh, yeah, man, we'll do that. That sounds great. So we went out there, and I literally said to the guy, I said, wouldn't it be funny if there was some 80s hair metal band who got stuck on an island for 20 years, and the only thing they had to listen to were pop CDs from the 80s when they got stuck. And I said, and they ended up singing like the Donna was metal. And like, they'd start playing a metal song, but then they'd start singing a pop song over it because they basically became brainwashed. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that's good. So Chuck is such an inventive guy, you know, that he went away for a couple of days when we got back and called me up and said, hey, man, come listen to this. And he started playing Enter Sandman. And I'm like, yeah, that's good, you know. And then he started singing Don't Stop Believing. And I went, oh, this is really, really good. I said, so this, this could work out. And he said, yeah, so we started putting these songs together, and it really became like fun, like making a puzzle, Brandon, because we got a list that we made of like all the coolest heavy metal riffs from the 80s, all the stuff that gets everybody on their feet, and then we put another list together of all like the coolest pop songs. And it was funny, because there were some goofy songs on there, too, and Chucky's like, dude, we're not doing Love Shack, we're not doing <laughs> that, you know. But because our the criteria quickly became they had to be great songs. They both had to be, or all three or all four, however many songs were into it, they all had to be great songs. So 
use that as a criteria. And Chuck had the harder job because he got to figure out how to bridge everything together and create how we're getting one and out of the other and the keys and the tempos and all that stuff. I would just basically walk in at 7.30 at night and go, dude, what about if we started playing Crazy Train and I started singing Jesse's Girl? Okay, I got to leave. And then I'd leave. <laughs> and, he, and, and, and he'd... Uh, He'd start putting it all together, and then he'd get it together, and he'd call me back, and there we have it, you know. But we really paid a lot of attention to uh, to quality in everything that we did, and we tried to, and hopefully you can hear that when you hear the stuff. Mm-hmm. Now, um, how much touring does Rock Sugar uh, do? Like, I've seen a video of you guys at Download, and I've uh, read that you guys opened for some big names like Rat and Queensryche and stuff. You know, we did a lot, and we, we were out there a lot at first. And basically, we don't do too much anymore, although, you know, we're still going to do the odd gigs here and there that come up that are really, really good. But there was, like, a very high demand for the band, and we were really anxious to get out and play. But the fact of the matter is now there's less shows because, honest to goodness, Chuck and I are so crazy busy. Now, Alex has this studio thing going, and there's so much going on that for us to do the rehearsals and go do the shows and stuff, the gigs really have to be choice gigs. So we get offered a lot of gigs that we say, I can't really make it happen there because the juice isn't worth the squeeze or whatever. Um, but yeah, we, we got so freaking blessed, dude. We were playing with, like, uh, as you said, we opened for all these bands that we love. We were on bills with Def Leppard. We were on bills with Aerosmith and ACDC and you know, it's an amazing feeling to your first show that you ever did. Look over on the side of the stage and Vince Neil there giving you a thumbs up. And you walk off and he goes, dude, you guys are freaking awesome. And you're like, wow, that was Vince Neil, man. You know, it's not like a guy imitating Vince Neil. It was really him. So, you know, that was uh, very exciting for us, the kind of validation that we got from, you know, most of the people who we've spoken to who stuff we've done. Because we, be, we wanted to be like the world's most original cover band. We don't want to be... <laughs> We don't want to be a strange cover band. We want to be a really crazy cover band. Yeah. Are there any plans for a new Rock Sugar album? Well, you know, that's a good question. Everybody asks that question. Uh, the, the simplest way to answer it is that the first one took so much work. And, you know, there's a lot of conjecture going on about what happened there. You can't buy it anymore. I think you can only get it on Amazon for like 200 bucks or something like that. It's ridiculous. And the reason for that is because one of the singers whose voice I'm imitating on the record heard the record and literally thought it was himself singing. So he got a lawyer, and he contacted us and said, you guys owe me all this money, and you have to apologize for using my voice without permission, and you have to cease and desist immediately. So we went and got a lawyer, and our lawyer said, they can't apologize for something they didn't do. That's not your client. It's this guy, Jess Harnell, who does voices for a living, and he's imitating your client. And they wrote back, and they said, no, nope, it's our opinion and, and the opinion of our client that that is definitely his voice. And unless you can prove otherwise immediately, we will be proceeding with a full-scale lawsuit against you. So we had to send them a forensic audio track, which means just the audio track of their singing with no music. Mm -hmm. And then they heard it, and they listened to it, and they sat on it for a while, and they wrote back, and they said, have them sing it again, less like this person. So I went into the studio, and I sang it again, less like them. Sent it to him, and he said, okay, this is better. I'll tell you what, if you put this version out instead of the old version, and we press all 100,000 CDs, I will consider, oh, and of course, pay my legal fees. I'll consider letting you sell your record again. So I said to my lawyer, I said, okay, when he says consider letting us use it again if we pay his legal fees, does that mean that we can pay his legal fees and he can still say no? And he said, absolutely. And I said, well, then we're not going to do that. Of so course. it kind of got, got stuck in the water because the legal fees for the lawsuit that he started, which turned out to be meritless, uh, were very, very substantial. It was like $22,000 or something Jeez. just for his side up. Our side was 10000 just to go back and forth with the kids, you know? So it kind of took the, um, I don't know, man, the enthusiasm away a little bit because now we're like, well, you know, what if we make another one and if we do our job effectively and it sounds just like somebody, what if somebody else hears it and goes, oh, I'm not going to let you sell this and you have to stop. And it's like, it's like so much work for the possibility of being cursed if we do our job too well. It's really, of course. really a weird situation. Um, but it's funny because, you know, we've got all these ideas for great songs and we mess around with them in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and, they're, and they're really good. I mean, we put out two of them. We put, we, we put a couple things before all this stuff really went crazy. We, uh, we put out a couple things online. One of them was a cross between uh, Kelly Clarkson and Led Zeppelin and Hart called nice. Since Your Barracuda Was an Immigrant. <laughs> Since You've Been Gone with Barracuda and the Immigrant Song. We put that out. And then we did a Journey and ACDC one, which is Highway to Hell with any way you want it, and it's called Any Highway You Want. <laughs> nice, yeah, I've heard that one. That one's great. Oh, thanks, man. So yeah, so that's first. Yeah, we don't. I don't know if we're going to be 
you know, one of these days, you know, and, and nothing is impossible, and we still have the ideas, and we can all still do the stuff. So who knows? Maybe I'll bump into this chat at a cocktail party here in Hollywood sometime, a while a chat, and they'll be like, you know what? Go ahead. It's cool. And then that'll change everything, and we'll probably, you know, go back in and do some more stuff. Mm-hmm. Could, could you guys just do, like, maybe put them up on YouTube for free or something like that? Or well, would, it, would it even be worth it? I don't know. Well, we, oh yeah, I mean, it's worth it. I mean, they're all up on YouTube. As far as, you know, people can go watch them all the time. As far as downloading, and we were strictly forbidden because, as he says, the version that exists sounds too much like him and it will be misleading to the public because they will assume that it's him. Yeah. That this, is, this is what I've been told. So, what about doing some uh, new Loud and Clear? Like, is that band basically dead or do you think you might resurrect it and do some more original stuff? Honestly, man, it's like, it, you, you know, it, it's sort of dead. I mean, it's not dead, it's just in a coma. Because it's like, you know, it, it's to reach a certain point in your life where you kind of go, well, what's, you know, what's profitable, what's not profitable? And mm-hmm. I'm really, really blessed because I have a great career. I mean, my career is, is crazy. Right now, I'm on two of the biggest cartoons on TV. They're both for little kids, but they're killing in the ratings. One is called Doc McStuffins. The other one is called Sophia the First. They're both on Disney, and they're like enormous. You know, I, I, I do all this voiceover stuff. So to go and, you know, write tunes, the whole melodic rock market is so weird now. It's like, uh, you know, it, it's basically being kept alive by a cult. Yeah. Because, you know, what's really strange about it is there's no way, unfortunately, that if you're a traditional straight ahead, like, melodic rock band, contemporary radio will not touch it because they, they, don't, they don't play, like, straight ahead rock and roll anymore. I think the last band to really break through was Nickelback, and that was like 12 years ago. Yeah. Um, and, and as far as classic rock, Nicky Six said it best, they asked him how he was going to make a new record. He goes, we don't really see the point. He said, because contemporary radio won't, won't touch it because we're a classic band. And he said, and classic rock radio won't play anything that's not at least 10 years old, so they won't play it either. So we're screwed, you know? And it's sort of the same thing. It's like, we love to make music, we love to create music, and I, we still love to write songs. But, you know, the amount of time and effort that you put into that for no reward is a fraction of the amount of time. I, I mean, it is, excuse me, it's like a hundred times what you put into something with great reward that is immediately there and it's available and it's great. So, you know, we're all so busy with other things that it just kind of becomes, hey man, you know, there's really not time for it, you know? Yeah, oh, fair enough. And the cool thing is, man, with, with Rock Sugar, we really got to fulfill so many dreams that we had when we were teenagers because all of a sudden, I mean, we, we played for 100,000 people one time there. It was like, you know, you have these dreams. When I, when I was a kid, you know, I had posters on the wall of these huge crowds with the band on stage. You know, you see the crowd. And, uh, like, I didn't have a picture facing the band. I had a picture facing the crowd on my wall. And you like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. And yeah. it took a while, but I, I eventually I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great, man. And what, what a great note to go out on. <laughs> Jess, I want to thank you so much for taking the time out to do the interview, man. This was a lot of fun. Uh, dude, you were great. The questions were good and insightful, and you did the research, and I appreciate that. And uh, seriously, thanks for supporting uh, you know, good music. It takes balls to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to play stuff I think is cool, and you're doing that, and I just want you to know it's appreciated by me and I'm sure many others. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, my friend. I'll talk to you again, Brandon. All right. Thanks so much, Jess. Thanks, pal. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye. You too.